Okay, let's uh, let's pray and then we'll we'll get started. Okay, Father, we we just want to thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this week, a new week that you've given us. Yes, Lord, we as your word declares that this is the day that you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity uh, that you've given us, the privileges that you give us, Lord, and uh, we thank you, God, for every Every new day, every new beginning, Father God, we thank you for this week that lies ahead. And um, we thank you, God, that your word says that, uh, God, that you called us to work, um, walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. And so uh, we will do that, Lord, each and every day and each and every week, Father God. Um, yes, Father God, we just want to thank you. We commit today, we commit this time into your mighty hands. We pray that you would speak, that you would... Uh, or um, speak to our hearts, that you would edify us, that you would um, renew, oh God, things to our minds, Father God. We thank you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory at this time. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, last class, we, we looked at... Um, the ministry of the teacher and we were studying some of the practical things of uh, doing the ministry of the teacher right practical keys of doing the ministry of the teacher and we um, i'm sorry and we finished by saying you know that we ourselves we need to do what we teach practice what we teach and also remain in that place of being teachable right that's what we um saw Okay, one section that we'll, we we said we'll um, handle later was the restoration of the ministry of the teacher, and um, and uh, one of the things that uh, so we'll we'll look at that today, and also um, look at a couple of um, um, maybe go through a couple of videos if we have the time, um, which talks about the uh, the teachers. Uh, the early teachers, and also uh, uh, have a look at the, the apostolic fathers, uh, whom we call as the apostolic fathers, who were right after the, um, uh, you know, after the apostles, that uh, they were there, uh, right up to, I think, even 300 AD. They were there and uh, kind of uh, reiterating, teaching the church, nurturing the church, and, uh, and writing down, uh, uh, recording, um, and making some of these things practical, some of these teachings practical um, for the life of the church. So we'll we'll look at a couple of videos uh, also. Okay, um, but when when we look at the restoration of the, the teaching ministry, we see that um, as we look at the um, um, this, the you know what we've studied in the Holy Spirit, the restorative moves of God. Right, we see uh, right from 1500 onwards, we see some specific moves of God, and we have, you know, we've looked at it over and over again. I think starting from the Holy Spirit uh, class, and uh, we looked at how um, God, after this, um, you know, starting with the Refor Reformation movement, we see that God restoring things, right, restoring the the doctrines, the teachings of the church back to the body of Christ. And we see that um, for doing or in doing so and for, and for bringing that restoration, we see God raising up people or, uh, who, would, who teach this, right? raising up people, raising up uh, uh, men and women who, who taught uh, faithfully, uh, irrespective of the uh, consequences. Right, starting from Re Reformation, even before the Reformation, you know, 200 years or 300 years before the Reformation, I'm sure you would have studied in the last uh, last class, um, church history. We see that people <clears throat> like uh, Jan Hus and um, Peter Waldo um, and all these uh, people, uh, John Wycliffe, you know, they they taught salvation, um, which is only in the name of Jesus, and it is not by works, but by um, uh, by faith. Uh, by, it is only through grace, only by grace, and through faith in the name of uh, the Lord Jesus. So we see that um, uh, they taught even before what we actually uh, recognize as the um, I'm sorry, as the Reformation, right? Uh, starting with uh, Martin Luther nailing those 95 theses uh, on the uh, door of the Cathedral of Wittenberg. 
and starting that spark and that fire of reformation, you know, spreading, um, uh, and and we see that 1500, and we see right from that time we see the the Puritan um, move uh, or the separation of church um, uh, from the state, and we see um, the uh, uh, the teaching of baptism, right? Um, teaching of baptism. Uh, being something that is um, that is uh, as a, as a, as a sign after someone believes. Oh, I'm sorry. I think um, I kind of lost. Um, can, I, I, can you can you hear me now? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, I I kind of lost the connection. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm in a different location, and I think that's uh, kind of caused that. Okay, okay. So we were talking. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're looking at the Anna, uh, the Anna Baptists, who uh, who were literally. Um, uh, um, rebaptizing, right? The ministry they were rebaptizing the people, and uh, based on uh, the genuineness of their belief, and, uh, uh, and 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 so on. So we see the Puritan move. We see the holy holiness move, where um, uh, the separate where we see the separation of the church from the uh, world. Right, from the ways of the world, from the influence of the world, from the culture of, of the world, so we uh, we see that. So in all these moves, we see people uh, being raised up who who taught fearlessly. Right, the divine healing movement and uh, the Pentecostal or the charismatic movement. We see people um, uh, teaching. We see people um, teaching these important core uh, doctrines of the church, and um, it was in the face of. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of persecution, a lot of challenges, because uh, everybody was not so inviting of these teachings, uh, even though they were scriptural and based on the word. So um, we see that uh, people persecuted um, these uh, uh, these teachers, uh, and uh, uh, people resisted uh, these um, these movements. Right, and and the and the, and the you know, the sad thing is that. These were people who were part of the earlier move. Like we see that uh, they were they were part of a um, uh, of earlier restorative move, um, but um, they you know they persecuted uh, the current uh, move of God, and right down to uh, the move of the uh, uh, the Holy Spirit restoring the uh, the truth of the fivefold ministry. And the movement of the saints, right? That um, that the believer is not to just come and attend church, and uh, you know, you know, just be uh, uh, there as a participant. I mean, as, as a as a as an audience to to just hear passively and go. But but really, to the believers there to do the work of ministry. Right. Like we read in Ephesians 4 and uh, verses 11 and 12, that the saints are equipped for the work of ministry. Now, they could be um, having a formal uh, or a full-time uh, work. You know, they might be involved in some vocation. Um, they might be in business. They might be in a, in a corporate setting. But uh, every believer is a saint who is to be equipped for the work of ministry, so which means that um, the 
the ministry is for every believer. So teachers <clears throat> played an important role that God would raise up these teachers. And um, when the Holy Spirit brought about these moves, the restorative moves, um, the teachers taught fearlessly. Okay, so we see that right through um, uh, post the uh, the Reformation. We see that, uh, and even before that. Right um, now, when we look at uh, the times after the, the apostles, uh, uh, soon after the apostles in the early church itself, we see that there were um, teachers. Uh, there were men of God who, whom you know, the, the church the historians call as the apostolic fathers. Right? So they established certain things, and even at those times, even in those days, there, there, there was um, uh, the the attack or you know constant threat of um, uh, either people, well, people not receiving the truth. That was one thing. The other thing was people um, who were teaching, you know, heretical things. There were all kinds of influences, so uh, there were a lot of heresies being taught as well. That uh, the truth was mixed with a lot of legends and folklore, and and we see all that also. So, so here were these, um, you know, that uh, what we call as uh, the apostolic fathers, who were teaching the truth, who were reiterating the truth, and some of them, interestingly, we see that they were, uh, they had, uh, they they had. Uh, contact, or they had, uh, uh, they had been mentored, or they they knew uh, personally the apostles uh, who walked with Jesus, you know, like Peter and John. So, um, for example, we read about uh, 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 the, we read about someone called Clement of Rome, right? Who um, was actually, you know, who said that he, he knew Peter personally, and he's, he's said to be uh, prayed over and uh, you know, uh, uh, and also consec I mean, uh, uh, consecrated for ministry by Peter himself, and and so on. So we see people like that: Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, um, uh, who was called the Bishop of the Church at Antioch, and um, who who stood for the faith, who were who were martyred for their faith, but who also um, were learned people, and they wrote letters and they established uh, teaching in all these letters for example ignatius of antioch is um, said to have written uh, you know at least uh, seven uh, seven of those two uh, two places like ephesus and uh, philadelphia the church in smyrna and and so on so um, to establish um, these uh, teachings and also some of the practical things okay and the earliest of these works, or which were which were actually, uh, which was actually a compilation of these practical teachings, was called uh, what was called the uh, Didache or Didache. Uh, it was it's spelled like this, uh, which was pronounced Didache, or it is also pronounced Didache. Okay. So which. Um, which is a compilation of teachings to the church, and and it was about various topics, topics like uh, um, like uh, uh, one uh, one was about you know about fasting, about uh, prayer, about uh, teachers, apostles, prophets, you know, the kind of support, and uh, and also uh, some of the things about uh, you know about communion and so on. So um, which was read in the church, early church, uh, which was not part of the canon. Like people knew that this was not inspired scripture, but something that was going to help them uh, because it was it, it had a lot of um, references uh, to scripture. <clears throat> and people knew that it was. Uh, but um, uh, with regards to the authors, probably it was, uh, I mean, like we don't know. Uh, the author was unknown. Um, but it was a compilation, and it was again used in the church in the early church, um, uh, and it was discovered uh, in the 1800s. Right. Um, so there were things like this. There were writings like this, which were uh, used and which were uh, very helpful for the church. Um, so let's. I just wanted us to um, watch a couple of videos. Um, 
and uh, which uh, which throw a lot of light on these apostolic fathers and uh, and also that that time uh, you know bef before the the, uh, the the Nicene Creed right the what is called the pre Nicene period and how these writings actually helped the church right and how these teachers who were somewhere from secular backgrounds who had who had accepted the Lord um, some were very, very uh, intel uh, intellectual. Some were learned, um, and, uh, and and a lot of them really wrote a lot of uh, like like Justin uh, Martyr and uh, and Eusebius, a uh, church historian. Justin Master, uh, Martyr um, was uh, an apologist, right? Much like uh, uh, Apollos, uh, um, we see that. You know, it was an apologist defending uh, the faith and and so on. So we'll um, yeah. So let's watch a couple of videos. Um, I I I will turn off the camera and so that the bandwidth is okay. Um, right. Now, who were the Apostolic Fathers? Put simply, the Apostolic Fathers were a group of figures who lived roughly from 75 on up until about 150 to 200 AD. Now, that last number obviously is a bit of a wide berth. 50 years is a bit of a stretch. And really going on up to the year 200 is a bit far to still be talking about the Apostolic Fathers. But give or take, this is roughly the time of the Apostolic Fathers' age. And all we mean by Apostolic Fathers is this. History has accorded the earliest writers and the earliest figures and pastors of the earliest church with the name the Fathers. Now, it depends on who you ask. If you ask a Roman Catholic the patristics age, as it's called, the age of the fathers, can go quite some time. It can go all the way up until the 5th century or even beyond. If you talk to others, they don't really like this term at all. Certain um, Anabaptist groups tend not to prefer to give an honorific to one age of the church, and those who see the early church as somewhat corrupt anyway tend not to glory in the writings from this period anyway. But both Protestants and Catholics are agreed that there was this patristics age, this age of the earliest centuries of the church, the church fathers. And so all kinds of folks in the first at least four or five centuries of the church can be called the fathers, the fathers of orthodoxy, you might say, or the fathers of the church. And so Augustine and Jerome and all of these earliest figures can be considered fathers. When we refer to the apostolic fathers, we're only referring to this earliest century of the church, those who were the bridge between the apostles themselves and the patristic age. And the figures that we're talking about are not all that numerous, and the writings from these folks are not all that significant. They're either short epistles or short little tracts and treatises. But we can list them here, just so that you're aware of them. There's Clement of Rome, who we've already mentioned. There's Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp, and Papias. There are a couple of books that are given the name of an author, but we're not entirely sure of its authenticity in terms of the name of the person who wrote it. And there are other books that simply have no author at all. The Shepherd of Hermas, for example, has no author listed with it. It's a prophetic utterance. Two of these texts in particular, though, we're going to separate and isolate and sort of study just briefly. One is the Epistle of Diognetus, which we're actually going to look at in our next lecture on early heretics in Christian orthodoxy. Right now, we're going to look at the Didache. Now, the Didache is a very important book from this earliest time, and in fact, it is actually the earliest surviving catechism from the early church, the Didache. Now, the name, the Didache, just simply means the teaching, or sometimes the teaching of the Twelve. Now, this text had for a long time been lost to us in the West. It was actually in 1873 that someone rediscovered the text in another codex. And ever since then, it's been studied as one of the earliest, if not the earliest, text that we have 
from the first and second century. Dating it is next to impossible, but it is certainly extraordinarily early, either the late first century or the early second century. And this text is a catechism. It's designed to instruct new Christians on the order and the structure of the faith and the way to live the Christian life in this period of time. And for that reason alone, it is extraordinary because it says so many things about the early church pattern of life that we're always interested in. Now, the teaching of the Didache is vital for understanding its impact in the earliest centuries. And it actually brings together all that we've talked about so far in this lecture, which is the early Christian desire to distinguish itself as the culmination and the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures, while yet also saying that the Christian way is different. And, on the other hand, distinguishing the Christian faith from the pagan world around it. And so if you go into the Didache and you read it, the earliest sort of move that the text makes is it lays out what it calls the two ways. And it says that there is one way which is the way unto death, and the other way which is the way unto life. And it opens in a very strikingly Jewish way. It opens with the Shema, the call in Deuteronomy and elsewhere in the Old Testament, that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It opens with this. And then it goes on to list the greatest commandment, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And it goes on down a list of programmatic comments, really, about the ways that Christians are to live their lives. It then, next, transitions to a number of prohibitions against activities or engagements with the world around it that Christians were supposed to take care and distance themselves from. They were, for example, to avoid things like murder and adultery, sexual promiscuity, theft, various sort of uh, earthy ethical things. Then there were other things that were listed that are clearly coming from the Roman pagan world, things like magic, sorcery, infanticide, abortion, perjury, coveting, all these things that are part and parcel to some of the Roman ethos. It even speaks about not bearing false testimony, about not holding grudges, not being double-minded, acting as though our yes is our yes and our no is our no. In other words, the Didache is calling for Christians to be upstanding citizens in the context of the ancient world that they do not participate in the things they consider to be idolatrous, but on the other hand, they will not be vindictive, oppressive, backbiting kinds of folks who are after their own gain and against that of their neighbors. So the text lays out all of these things that the Christian is supposed to do as he conducts himself in the world. The other half of the document, though, deals with the rituals and the formation of the church's worship. And it's this section that always draws the attention of students and scholars and experts and novices and everyone in between. Because in this section, the Didache actually lays out some instructions for baptism and the Eucharist and for fasting in the early church that are unrivaled in their explicit design. Baptism, for example, for all the debates that uh, a lot of modern post-reformational people have over baptism, particularly in the mode of baptism, do you sprinkle or do you dunk? Well, very interestingly enough, the Didache doesn't really seem to care at all. In fact, it doesn't mention anything to do with sprinkling or dunking. It does seem to have a preference for immersion in some level. However, it makes the case that sometimes immersion is impossible because you don't have enough water. The one thing that the Didache does care about, though, is that there is at least some pains taken to try to find what it calls living water, which is to mean a running river. That if possible, that baptism was to be done in living water, that is to say a stream. Now, the Didache does not cast anathemas on those who are unable to do this. It just says, if you're able, do this, that's fine. He also says that those who do the baptizing and those who are to be baptized should fast for at least a day or two beforehand to prepare their hearts and minds for what they're about to undertake. He says, if immersion is impossible in living water, that's fine, just pour the water three times over the head. And I do believe, once and for all, that should put to rest the mode of baptism problem. Those who think that the practice is so clear one way or the other should take a little bit of the pragmatism of this document into their hearts and realize that if you're into immersion, that's fine, but if you can't immerse, Pouring over the head three times is just as sufficient for the baptism. Secondly, the Didache is very clear on some of the language used in the Eucharist. 
In fact, you might even say that this is liturgical language. Now, I don't mean that it's formalistic liturgically, but just simply that just as we see in the book of Corinthians, where Paul is giving some comments about what is said during the Eucharistic service, the Didache repeats many of these lines almost verbatim, though not entirely so. It says that concerning the cup, we say, We thank thee, our Father, for the holy vine of David thy servant, which thou madest known to us through Jesus thy servant, to thee be the glory forever. And there is a similar refrain for the bread when it is offered as well. Clearly, in other words, the early church is Eucharistic. So in other words, if you are of the opinion that the Lord's Supper is a lot of gobbledygook that was sort of invented and a lot of liturgy that was sort of trumped up over three centuries of the early part of the church, you need to really wrestle with the didache. From the beginning, it is saying that the Eucharist matters, and here is the form and the language and the vocabulary we use during this part of the service. Another thing that the Didache cites as part of the practice of the early church is the practice of fasting. Very interestingly enough, this is one of the points when the early church does take a real sort of cultural stand against Judaism, though not in practice. It was the practice of the Jews to fast two days a week. And the Jewish practice was to fast on Monday and Thursday. That is to say, from sunup to sundown on Monday and Thursday, Jews would abstain from food. They would perhaps give that money away that they would have bought food with. Maybe they'd give the food itself away to the poor. But on Mondays and on Thursdays, the Jews would fast. Well, the Didache says in no uncertain terms that the Christians do not fast, quote, with the hypocrites. But instead, the Christians fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. <laughs> and so the practice is still the same. They just chose two alternative days in the week to have their fasts. He also says that the Christians pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. And he says very explicitly that by this point, Christians are increasingly choosing not to pray with their Jewish brethren. That at some point, their difference in their understanding of the Messiah was causing them to be unable to pray together because they were praying to different ends and for different means and, frankly, to different gods, at least in terms of different understandings of what God had wrought in the person of Christ. And he says that at this point, the Christians and the Jews had begun to pray separately and that the Christians prayed the Lord's Prayer three times a day. In the end, what we know about the Apostolic Fathers is really only piecemeal. We always wish we knew more. We always wish we had smoking guns about, you know, early church worship liturgies that were still sort of left lying around. We wish that the practices of the early church were more obvious to us at times. Frankly, one of the most important questions is, how did this untethering of the Jewish and the Christian world go about? Because from the very beginning, we see some movements away from Judaism, very self-conscious movements away, not just animosity either, not just simply Christians rejecting Jews through anti-Semitism, but real structural, doctrinal, liturgical problems when one is worshiping Messiah as Lord and one is not, and the church having to reckon with that and deal with its own identity as the followers of Christ. We also wish we knew more about just simply day-to-day -day life in the early church. Uh, unfortunately, those pieces are hard to come by. What we have, though, in the early church, right in the dawn of the post-apostolic age, is some real broad sketches of a faithful church that is following Christ, that is attempting to distinguish itself from paganism on the one hand, and having a bit of a difficult time understanding its relationship culturally in day and day out life with the Jewish synagogue that was on the other side of the Christian church. The Christians obviously knew where they stood, Christ was Lord, but Christians also had to reckon with the fact that a number of them in the earliest decades were Jewish converts, and they were so wrapped up in the traditions and the rituals of things, not all of which were bad and pharisaical, that they had to understand how is the Christian going to find its own way and its own pattern of life in this world. And we see some of this in the Didache. Now, the next thing to come up is as the world begins to take its eye and it looks at the church and it begins to say things about the church, as the pagans look at the church and begin to cast aspersions and make fun of it for being sort of poor and weak and foolish, and as the Jews begin to attack Christianity as being 
abhorrent and a bastardization of the Jewish faith. The next step in the Apostolic Father's Age is a transition from simply maintaining its own ethos and developing its own ministry internally to a new move of what we call apologetics. And apologetics is the explanation and the defense of the Christian faith to the outside world. And that transition is a vital one because what we begin to see with the rise of the apologists is a full-scale defense of why the Christian faith is the truth and the life and why the scriptures are fulfilled in Christ. And when we get to that age, we begin to see the real flourishing of Christian writings. And we will look at that subject in our next lecture. Okay, so um, a little bit of uh, what was there in the Didache, the Didache. Um, but we also need to understand that, um, you know, uh, just want to apologize about the typos in that video. Uh, someone didn't proofread. But, um, um, but we also need to understand that some of the, uh, some of the practices uh, of the of the church, you know, some of the things that crept in, uh, which were not really helpful, not really scriptural. Okay, so we need to um, understand that as well, um, uh, especially you know about some of these things about fasting and uh, and also you know about the baptism. I think it was just a practical thing that uh, if there was no water, right? but we also know that uh, you know uh, the the word baptizo it means to immerse completely. Right. So, yeah, just a couple of uh, things that I thought we should clarify there. Um, but we see that, uh, you know, this was so writings like these, uh, which were there, um, which uh, which which were really helping the, uh, the early church believer right, um, to uh, and pointing the, uh, the early believer back to scripture. And if there was confusion because of, uh, you know, the various uh, teachings that were doing the rounds, um, um, uh, agnosticism and Arianism and, and all that. Uh, it was, these were, you know, keeping them grounded. Um, these were pointing them back to scripture, right? So, um, yeah, there's another video. Probably I'll, I'll share the link. Maybe you can, you know, you can watch that. Okay, so so we see several other names like uh, uh, Clement of Rome, Ignatius, um, Irenaeus, Eusebius, um, and also uh, Tertullian, uh, Montanus, who later you know it became a uh, it, uh, it became a uh, a heresy, heretical kind of a teaching, an extreme teaching, and we also read about Origen. Uh, and, and so on. Uh, you know, these were the people who were there, um, uh, who were uh, um, nailing down uh, doctrine, pointing to the truth. Um, uh, but at the same time, we also see that, uh, yes, there were people who were fallible and uh, maybe in practice and, and also in, in their, uh, uh, in, in wanting to, uh, wanting to you know, uh, do certain things in their sincerity, probably, you know, they laid down some legalistic things as well, you know, like what we heard about, okay, you need to fast uh, and pray in order to prepare for baptism. And also, you know, you need to fast on these days. So, so that was also some of the things which were, uh, which, which had crept in, right? So, so we need to understand that you know, as we, read about them and also uh, read about their teachings right okay any any questions here um, or anything that you may have you might have read or that you want to share um, None whatsoever. Okay. 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 Then let's uh, let's move on to the next chapter, which is uh, uh, chapter ten, and we're looking at uh, 
the ministry gift of the pastor, right? We looked at the evangelist and we studied about the teacher. And uh, now we, we'll move on to look at the ministry gift of the pastor. Okay. Now, um, let's look at uh, a few scripture which point to the fact that the Lord Jesus himself, um, you know, referred to himself as the as a pastor, or in other words, the word used there is uh, is a shepherd, right? The Greek word used there, from which uh, we get uh, the English translation uh, of pastor, is actually the shepherd. Right? So we know that the Lord Jesus referred to Himself as the shepherd or as the good, good shepherd, right? So uh, let's look at a few um, uh, scriptures here. Okay, Matthew twenty six and verse thirty one. If you're following the notes, it's on page 25, Matthew 26 and verse 31. Okay. Um, then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. Okay. So he's referring to the fact that he's uh, going to the cross and they will be, uh, the, the disciples themselves will be persecuted. So he's saying, um, you know, you will be made to stumble because of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So here, you know, here is a is a reference that uh, he is referring to himself as the shepherd. Okay, and uh, the and what happens because of what happens to the shepherd that the sheep will be scattered. Okay, um, Hebrews thirteen and verse twenty. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant and so on. So again, the writer of Hebrews referring to Jesus as the, the great shepherd of the sheep. Okay, um, And we know that the Lord himself in John chapter 10 said, I am uh, so-and-so, I am the good shepherd. Okay, um, First Peter chapter two. Okay, and uh, Peter says um, he's referring to the people. He's referring to the believers, and he says, "You were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd." and overseer of your souls. Um, the verse before that refers to the Lord Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And we having died to sins might live for righteousness. So here uh, is talking about us. Uh, he's talking to the believer as a sheep going astray. He says, now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls, obviously the Lord Jesus, reference to the Lord Jesus, right? Um, first Peter 5, again, he talks about um, the shepherd. First Peter 5 and verse 2, in giving instructions to the to the leaders, right, who are, who are in places of oppositions of spiritual leadership, right? First Peter 5, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, sh save, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory, which does not fade away. That does not fade away. So here, referring to the Lord Jesus as the chief shepherd. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. Um, um, several things that we learn about uh, about the shepherd here. Um, 
So he, in verse 2, he says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as an overseer. So a shepherd is an overseer. And uh, how does an overseer, uh, you know, does the function of shepherding or overseeing, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those interested to you. Okay, so he lists down a few things here that a shepherd should not do, right? uh, which means the Lord Jesus, as the chief shepherd, does not do these things. And so, um, so as the uh, as the overseer, as a shepherd, the flock of God. Um, you know, first thing that we uh, see here, I'm just making a digression here, but then we learn quite a bit about um, the relationship between the sheep and the shepherd, the pastor and the flock, right? So he says, a shepherd, the flock of God, okay? Uh, so the first reference here, um, I mean, the first thing that we can uh, learn here is that Peter saying that this flock that you are leading as the shepherd, it is the flock of God. Okay. So it's a flock of God, meaning this flock or the people uh, whom he's referring to as flock and sheep and so on, they belong to God. Right? So they belong to God. So he's saying this is the flock of God. Um, so it's, it's not like the shepherd owns or shepherd is anyway entitled for certain things. Um, none of that, right? So we see it's the flock of God. So um, something that is of God, which God entrusts to the overseer in order to oversee, in order to shepherd. Um, but really, the owner is God himself, the chief shepherd himself, right? So we see that. Um, Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as an overseer, right? Serving, serving a, a, as a steward, as a manager, as an overseer, knowing that, uh, which again has several um, uh, implications, meaning that you will have to give, uh, you are accountable, right? Uh, in the way you carry out your shepherding or you carry out your overseeing, that you are accountable. Right. You are an overseer, you are a steward, therefore you are accountable, right? serving as overseers. And it also qualifies, you know, how should one serve? Okay. So not by compulsion, but willingly. Okay. So not by compulsion, this is, anyway, it, it's the call of God, it's the invitation of God, it is the flock of God. So it is uh, to be carried out willingly, and not by compulsion, right? Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Okay. So that's the thing. Uh, if there's any intention that it is uh, going to be, uh, you know, something that is of um, that is going to be of of gain materially, or in terms of fame, in terms of you know, however else that one might think, says not for dishonest gain. Okay, but eagerly you serve as an overseer willingly you serve and as an overseer um, eagerly and again the third one is not as lords over those entrusted but as being examples to the flock you know not as lords not as people who are bossy not as ones who are dictating terms um uh, well, well we know that uh, there is spiritual authority uh, to whom, um, uh, you know, the, the, the leaders to whom the Lord gives that authority, social authority, to carry out the task. And like Paul writes, it is for edification and not for destroying the person or, or the people. Right? It is for edification. So saying not as being lords over those interested, but being examples. So you uh, shepherd or you do or carry out the task of overseeing, being an example yourself, right? being examples to the flock in whatever you oversee, in whatever you, inst you instruct, um, be example to the flock. Okay? And 
when the chief uh, shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Okay, so um, the chief shepherd, he's the one who's ultimately so, which means that he's going to um, he's going to review things, right? He's going to um, you're going to be accountable to him. He's going to review certain things, and um, and the reward comes from him. Okay, the reward is not something that I take for myself, or um, the reward comes from the chief shepherd. Okay, so um, some very important things um, that we see um, listed here uh, when Peter writes about the shepherd is reference to Jesus being the chief shepherd, and uh, and also about the the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, or the overseer uh, and the sheep. Right. Okay. And another place where I mean we all know uh, is John chapter ten, where the Lord refers to himself as the good shepherd and he contrasts between uh, the shepherd and uh, the hireling okay someone who's there on hire and he contrasts between their intentions he contrasts between um, the 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 quality of their work and the, the motive of their heart the attitude of their attitude with which they carry out the, the task, etc. So he talks about that as well. So let's um, let's turn to John, um, John chapter ten, and let's read through. Okay, um, uh, first twenty nine verses. So let's let's read through, and uh, and then we'll uh, we, we'll we'll uh, you know pick out a few verses and talk about that. Okay, John chapter ten, verse one. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his name, his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Okay, so uh, let's look at these first six verses. Uh, he says, I say to you, he who does not come, um, enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. You know, and we, we are going to read further when he says, refers to himself as the door and refers to himself as the shepherd also. Right. So this is how he does. The the sheep hear his voice. He calls the sheep by name, leads them out. And when he brings his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him and they know his voice. OK, um, let's read from verse seven onwards. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Uh, verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. So he talks about the uh, good shepherd. He talks about the hireling. And he also refers to himself as a door through which the sheep enter the sheepfold. Uh, but uh, we're just going to focus on you know, him being the shepherd. So he says, I am the good shepherd. Um, and he also says, the, this is the opposite of what the thief does. Right? The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. Um, but I have come that they may have life and they may have it more 
abundantly, very reassuring um, that he comes as the shepherd, that he is a good shepherd, and he has come that we might have life and life more abundantly. Okay, so we'll take a break, quick break, and then um, we'll come back after the break and continue. 